severe. Where are we going to have it? When? How soon are we going to start working on it? So important. Another uh, issue, and I'll cover some of these a little more quickly, the loss of biodiversity. And I, I want to commend the Wild Rockies Alliance for having uh, species like the grizzly and the bull trout uh, as your hallmark species. But the fact is that uh, it's uh, the most biologically diverse ecosystems that are the most resilient uh, in harsh conditions. The bulwark against invasion of exotic species. And again, uh, in many cases, our higher elevation, our wilderness areas, our roadless areas are the areas that are today most biologically diverse. In fact, uh, uh, according to Nature Conservancy's survey, 181 of the 327 watersheds identified as critical to conserve biodiversity in the United States are on national forest system lands. But you know, that isn't always the way it was because the fact is that the areas that were historically most biologically diverse are your bottom lands, your riparian areas, and are primarily in private ownership today. So we're looking at this remnant of high elevation, undisturbed areas, really thinking that, gee, you know, these are really biologically diverse. Well, the fact is that's what's left uh, in many areas, and we need to somehow reverse that trend. Uh, Leopold's famous quote, to keep every cog in the wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. Leopold uh, spoke with great sadness when he spoke about one of the missing cogs in the wheel when he was talking to the planners of the Passenger Pigeon Monument. And this is what he said. There will always be pigeons in books and in museums. These are effigies and images dead to all hardships and dead to all delights. Book pigeons cannot dive out of the cloud to make a deer run for cover, nor clap their wings in thunderous applause of mass-laden woods. They know no urge of seasons. They feel no kiss of sun, no lash of wind and weather. They live by not living at all. That says it all when it comes to species extinction. <laughs> Off-road vehicles in that challenge, I believe, will be, at least for the public lands, probably the issue of the decade. Uh, and it's going to be a challenging issue to deal with, a controversial issue. And my hope is that, I, that we get on with it, uh, because the longer we wait, the more challenging it will be. And, um, I hope that we've learned from issues like the spot at all that, that we shouldn't leave things to the court system to decide that we should roll up our sleeves and, and dive in there and realize that it's going to be controversial, but it's something we need to deal with. For example, in, in my home state, we've got two national forests, 1.5 million acres, the Shawamigan and Nicolay. The Shawamigan is uh, open unless marked closed. The Nicolay is closed unless marked open. Now, Roger, how'd you like to deal with the, uh, the controversies associated with that when people really don't know what national forest they're on? Uh, challenges we need to come to grips with um, that won't get any easier. Uh, I want to mention private land conservation uh, only because that's really where the great strides in watershed restoration uh, are to be made. Uh, because it's really all connected. And, and the fact is, in the United States, we've got 9.9 .9 million woodland owners, and only 5% have professionally developed science-based management plans for whatever purpose or goal they have. And, and this is not a big brother coming in and telling you what to do with your land. Uh, this is somebody coming in with the best science, a professional, and, and your objective might be to grow sugar maple and make maple syrup. It might be a, a small game bird habitat. It might be a short rotation species of aspen. It might be almost anything. And the fact is there's a crying need on private lands for better professionally based management that will increase profit margins of landowners significantly. And in most cases, the service is free. We've got a, a long way to go. 
in uh, private land conservation. We've come a long way, and I can't talk about private land conservation without at least mentioning urban forests. 60 million acres of urban forest in the United States. In the city of Atlanta, if you plant three trees of the right species in the right location around a single family home, over an uh, entire community, you, re you reduce your air conditioning cost by 40% and significantly reduce stormwater runoff costs. Not only do you improve the aesthetic qualities and the beauty of the city, you do a lot for energy conservation, you do a lot for clean water and stormwater runoff. It's so important. In fact, as I watch foresters grapple with the challenges they've had as we move through the to cut trees, not to cut trees, the clear cut debates, and all of these kinds of things. And yet, yet here we deal with uh, this tremendous opportunity of 60 million acres of urban forest, and you know people love trees. Tremendous benefits uh, to cities and towns. And the last one I want to mention uh, is, uh, and this is my number 10 of the 10 biggies, is education. And uh, I mention it last, uh, perhaps, because I believe it's ultimately perhaps the more, most important. Um, what we need is we need an informed debate. We need people that respect the land, that feel connected to nature, and we're dealing with a populace where 80% of the American public lives in urban areas and large cities and towns, with fewer and fewer people growing up further disconnected from the land. Milk comes from the jug, water comes from the tap or the bottle in the uh, machine in the store. Uh, the fact is that that's really not the way it is. And I mentioned uh, Aldo Leopold is, is one of my heroes. And I was at, a, at the Leopold Conference a couple of years ago in Madison. It was the, 20th, uh, the 50th anniversary of the publication of the San County Almanac. And I was on a panel with Nina Leopold Bradley and the entire Leopold family are just very, very humble, wonderful people. And someone asked her the question about, well, what was it like to be with Dad at the shack as a little girl? And uh, her answer was very crisp and simple. And it was, that's where we learned to connect with nature. And the fact is our public lands, as more and more private lands become inaccessible that are posted. You've got to belong to a hunting club, a fishing club. You've got to own a lease, or perhaps it's, it's, it's uh, just off limits. Uh, it's, uh, we're putting more and more people on the uh, remaining, remaining acres of public land that we have. And this is where this urban population, the people that recreate, that learn how to connect with the land, that's so important. And perhaps a second very, very important value for public lands beyond water will likely be education in this century. Uh, one of the few remaining places that people can go. And I mean, I'm not that old. You know, I may be retired from the Forest Service, but I'm, I'm not as old as Bill Wharf. Uh, and where I grew up, uh, uh, almost all the private land is posted. I moved to Virginia, where I lived for almost 15 years. I want to go hunting. I belong to a hunting club. Had a pretty good deal. But a lot of people can't afford to belong to a hunting club. It's just too much hassle. Uh, and uh, this is why public lands connected to education is so important. And we've got to connect people to the land. Uh, because education, as I think about the theme of uh, your rendezvous, is about making connections. Uh, it's about making connections in people's minds, about making connections in people's hearts, helping them understand why protecting the core is important, helping them understand why the core is important and what the core is. And that core is our old growth forests, our wildlands, uh, the source of our clean water, habitats for our species to persist. It's about the quality of life. Thank you, and have a wonderful rendezvous. Thank you.
Welcome. I'm Margaret Andera, curator here at the Milwaukee Art Museum and curator of the Magnetic North, uh, the Landscapes of Tom Utek exhibition. And before I introduce our speaker this evening, I wanted to just basically plug some other programs that are going on at the museum. Um, after tonight's lecture, you can enjoy our very first TGIT, thank goodness it's Thursday, which is out on the Baumgartner Terrace. You may have seen it when you came in until 8 o'clock. Appetizers and a cash bar are available. And more um, UTEC programming in two weeks, Tuesday, July 27th, our chief educator, Barbara Brownlee, is going to be giving a gallery talk through the UTEC exhibition at 1.30. It's a Tuesday afternoon. Thursday, August 5th, Kevin Avery, who is um, a painting curator from the Metropolitan Museum in New York, is going to be coming to discuss American landscapes in conjunction with uh, the Tom UTEC exhibition. And finally, any nature lovers are sure to enjoy the August 19th evening gallery talk through the exhibition given by birder Tom Schultz. He will um, walk through the show emphasizing the birds in all of um, UTEC paintings particularly. And as an introduction to Michael Dombeck, um, he is one of the most renowned and respected contemporary conservationists. He de he's dedicated a quarter of a century to managing federal lands and natural resources in the long-term public interest. His leadership in the Bureau of Land Management and as a former chief of forest services impacted nearly 500 million acres. His legacy of one, is one of steadfast stewardship for the land, and he is most noted for significant efforts toward watershed health and restoration, sustainable forest ecosystem management, sound forest roads, and roadless area protection. He has authored and co-authored and edited over 200 popular and scholarly publications, including the book Watershed Restoration, Principles and Practices, and most recently the book From Conquest to Conservation, Our Public Lands Legacy. Dr. Dombeck now serves as GEM Prof Pioneer Professor and UW System Fellow of Global Conservation. He is helping to lead the planning and development of the Global Environmental Management Education Center in the College of Natural Resources at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. And he wanted to make sure that I told you that he spent 11 summers as a fish guide in the um, Hayward area of Wisconsin. And I also want to add that you may have heard him today on WUWM at the At 10 program where you were excellent. I only wish they would have mentioned you were coming to speak tonight. Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Dombeck. Jerry, after that introduction, I should probably just sit down uh, and not say anything and disappoint you. Uh, well, I, uh, I always like to refer back to my years of guiding, and a lot of it was spent on the Chippewa Floyds. Uh, knew the Trelands well, went to high school with all of them, and uh, also have this close connection with Stevens Point, so thank you for coming. I want to mention that my sister Lori is here with her husband, Cal. Uh, they gratefully picked me up at the airport and chauffeured me down here today in one piece and, uh, and are actually going to sit through what I have to say, uh, but probably never again. Uh, and I also visited with some old friends from the Forest Service that are in the audience and a lot of people are listening to Nancy tonight, I understand, out here. But the, the reason I, I always like to refer to the fishing in the Chippewa flowage is that um, Having uh, grown up and being born in central Wisconsin and then uh, uh, went to most of my grade school years and high school in the Hayward area of northern Wisconsin, spent 11 summers on those beautiful lakes up there, never in my wildest dreams that I want to end up in a big urban area or think that I would have spent 15 years in Washington, D.C., which is referred to by some as a 14 square miles surrounded by reality. But uh, there was a consolation prize, and that's that my office as chief of the Forest Service overlooked the body of water that produced the U.S. record carp. And, and that, that is no fish story. It was a 57-pounder caught in 1983 out of the Tidal Basin. And I know some of you that have as much gray hair as I have, when you think of the Tidal Basin, you probably think of Wilbur Mills and, and somebody else. Uh, but uh, uh, that's a great fishing hole. Um, I'm just so pleased that you came to primarily, I hope, to look at uh, Tom Utek's wonderful art that's inspired by the land and uh, 
oftentimes when we think about art, we don't really think about its impact on social issues, on national policy. But the fact is, it does have a tremendous impact, and especially in the field of conservation, has had a tremendous impact, uh, not only over the years, but over the centuries. Uh, the first place that we really saw the impact of art landscape uh, painting in 1860, uh, Fred Edwin Church painted a masterpiece called Twilight in the Wilderness. In 1864, on July 1, Abraham Lincoln signed the first piece of public policy dedicating land uh, for the purpose of resort, recreation, and conservation. And that was when he set aside uh, the Mariposa Grove of Giant Sequoias, which is now Yosemite National Park. And we often don't think of Abraham Lincoln as one of our conservation leaders, but in fact he was the first president to take some sort of national policy action recognizing the value of land beyond something that needed to be conquered or exploited. And uh, that was influenced by the art of the era. And uh, we see a message in Tom Utek's art and a message that I'm gonna talk about just a little bit today. And uh, there's so many issues in conservation that we could cover. And I wanna mention uh, simply a few. And I wanna talk about the land I want to talk about security. I want to talk about securing the health of the land and how important this is. Because if we think about this word security and how often we've heard it in the last three years, and now I ask you to think about what does it really mean? The president has requested in one plug $87 billion, which Congress appropriated in the name of national and world security to keep all of us more secure. And hearing this word over and over and over again, uh, not one single day goes by that you read the paper or turn on the TV that you don't heard, hear the word security. I, I think about what it means in the context of the land, in the context of long-term cultures and values. And I ask myself, aren't we making a mistake as a society and as a nation by viewing security simply as dealing with the immediate threat of terrorism today, weapons of mass destruction today. What does it mean to secure the long-term health of the land? And there are all kinds of threats. And yes, the threat of terrorism is something that we absolutely have to deal with. It's critical. But my plea is not to overlook the other threats that are out there. And to put what I'm talking about into a historical perspective, I wanna talk for a few minutes about a place that's dominated world news in the last year or so, and that's this place called Iraq. And I want you to picture Iraq on the globe and Baghdad and its location, which happens to be between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, the home to Mesopotamia, one of the two great cradles of civilization. In fact, the very cradle of agriculture, the biblical Garden of Eden. This is where this place, Baghdad, is today. And at one time, it was lush and green and productive with societies that developed the very agricultural practices that we still utilize today. And now I want you to ask yourself what you see on TV when you see pictures of Baghdad in Iraq. Uh, you don't see lush green valleys. You don't see streams flowing. And the answer is fairly simple. Uh, it's in part too many people putting too much pressure on the land for too many years. And unfortunately, the story of ancient Iraq and the many civilizations that have fallen because of the way people treated the land, certainly not intentionally, but the fact is we're repeating that today. And today, we at least in this nation know better. Some developing nations simply don't have the means. Uh, I wanna give you an example. Uh, just uh, last December I spent almost a month 
in the West African country of Mali, where my daughter Mary is in the Peace Corps. And Mali is one of the 10 poorest countries in the world. I see somebody smiling. Do you know Mali? Have you been to West Africa? Oh, great. Uh, where? And I close. At any rate, Mary's uh, uh, homologue or community liaison's name is Bwemi Kone. And Bwemi appeared to be about 45 years old. And by our standards, Bwemi's illiterate, although he can speak four languages. And he and I couldn't communicate only through an interpreter, which made me feel pretty humble. But Bwemi's a farmer. And uh, Bwemi has a large family, an extended family. And uh, I was out on Bruce, which is out in the bush with Bwemi. Uh, he was showing me his land, and he was explaining to me how when he was a little boy, he was so proud of the fact that he defended his family's cattle herd from a lion, but he hasn't seen one since, 40 years. He was explaining to me how the amount of sand is increasing and how the topsoil is disappearing and how the vegetation is disappearing and how now uh, his family only plants millet every other year and corn maybe every third year uh, because of the decreasing productivity of the soil and the desertification that's occurring. And he also explained to me on another piece of property that his family owned how he was preserving the vegetation because it would be more fertile and it would be a place where his grandchildren could grow crops. And I'm thinking to myself, this, by our standards, illiterate man did understand the land and understand what happens over the long haul and unfortunately doesn't have the capability to do much about it. But the bottom line is uh, what's happening to the land isn't unique to third world countries, to developing nations, to faraway places. Um, we have problems here in the United States. We have problems right here in this county, uh, right here in this state, and all around. And it's important that we deal with them. Uh, I admonish all of our politicians for not bringing some of these easy to solve issues to the forefront. And that's why it's so important, it's so important that when we think about security, we talk about our relationship with the land and what it means to us. And I've got to admit that I've got one very, very strong bias. And that bias is this, that all wealth stems from the land. And we live in the most highly advanced, highly technological society ever. And yet, the food we eat comes from the soil, the topsoil, the interaction of topsoils with microorganisms, the water, the vegetation, the air, and it's all wrapped together. And that's ultimately what quality of life is about when all is said and done. So I have this bias, and I use the term land sort of in the Leopoldian sense, uh, and not just the firm surface of the earth that we stand on, but the soil, the water, the air, the interaction of the biota, and all that it produces for not just humans, but all of life on Earth when I talk about land. So now I want to spend a few minutes talking about, I don't know, maybe five or six issues that, that I believe are important. And there are lots more issues out here. In fact, I was visiting with someone on the way in that uh, we talked about, well, how can we talk about all these conservation issues in 30 or 40 minutes? Well, the fact is we can't. And I won't say much about population. I won't say much about uh, global warming, climate change, many of the huge overarching issues, simply because uh, there isn't time, but we need to acknowledge their importance. I want to start out by talking about water for just a few minutes. And this is the issue of the millennium. Uh, the, United States, uh, the United Nations Economic Commission issued a report uh, just a short time ago that said by the year 2025, two-thirds of the world population will be dealing with a water shortage. Mismanagement of our vegetation, of our soil, changing weather patterns are the primary causes. And it's not just a problem in Mali, West Africa. Uh, it's a problem right here in the U.S. And it's not just a problem in the arid southwest where we're fighting over water or the Colorado River. It's not just a problem in the Great Plains um, where the Ogallala Aquifer that extends from South Dakota to Texas, although in, in fact uh, the largest water tank in the country that contained water was there as much as 10,000 years ago, and now is anywhere from 10 to 100 feet be below once measured levels. It's, it's not just a problem 
in places like that, right here on the shores of the Great Lakes. Imagine this, 20% of the fresh surface water in the world is right out there. And it rains 30 inches a year. And how can it be that the mayors of the four largest suburbs of Chicago say that water is one of their major issues? No place on earth is bestowed with more water than we are. The state, Wisconsin, is gathering waters, beautiful waters, yet only 7% of our surface waters of the state are completely free of, of pollution. Water tables are falling. Listen to some recent headlines. Central Wisconsin Sunday, May 9, 2004. State's water purity takes an alarming dip. Population growth, falling water table, contribute to murky issue. Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, May 22. Area aquifer projected to drop 125 feet by 2020. This is Waukesha County. I know some of you live there. Um, and it, the projected decline in the region's deep sandstone aquifer comes on top of a 500 foot drop that has already occurred between 1900 and 2000. Well, I gotta tell you, I commend the Wisconsin Academy of Sciences for taking the leadership with the Waters of Wisconsin initiative to help bring many of these issues to the forefront. And I hope that we have the courage to act on them before we have the problems that other parts of the country or other parts of the world have in this water-rich area that we happen to live in. And I gotta tell you, as Chief of the Forest Service, you struggle with issues and controversy. And finally, I decided the issue that I would talk about more than anything else was the issue of water. Because in fact, the very organic legislation that was passed in 1897 to establish the National Forest of the United States said something like this, that no forest reserve, they weren't called national forests until 1905, that no forest reserve shall be established except to protect the forest within the boundary, to secure favorable conditions for water flows, and provide a sustainable supply of timber. And in fact, the Eastern National Forest, our national forest in, in Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan, uh, basically west of the Mississippi, were set up under the authority of the Weeks Act that was passed in 1911 with the primary purpose of water and watershed restoration. And yet somehow, after World War II, we seem to have forgotten this major mandate this policy mandate that we had uh, for forest and water. Well, I gotta tell you, this is not rocket science. The cleanest and most water in the United States comes off of our forested landscape. One third of the U.S. is forested, it produces two thirds of the runoff. And collectively, uh, I had, used to give a speech that I called the world's largest water company, our forest. And yet, we knew the value of a board for the timber, a ton of coal, a barrel of oil, an ounce of gold, and we didn't know the value of the water that was coming off of our public land. So about 1998, I commissioned a team of scientists led by Dr. Jim Sedell that some of you may know to value the water from the National Forest as we were into these other debates as to whether or not to cut timber and if so, how much and where. How about the mining and oil and gas exploration? And what we found out is that the National Forest, 192 million acres, 8% 8 of the surface area of the U.S., produced water directly for 66 million Americans in 3,400 communities in 33 states at a value of about $3.7 billion a year. And that's calculating the value of the water not at $1.29 a bottle. That's calculating the value of the water at $2 an acre foot in the east and $4 an acre foot in the west because we knew as soon as we released this information there would be congressional hearings from the commodity industries. And um, my view is that the bottom line for a land manager really ought to be water quality. Because when all is said and done, if you're doing a good job on the uplands, if you're doing a good job on the forest, if you're doing a good job on maintaining your roads, the streams are probably gonna be okay. There, it's an easy indicator to measure and perhaps uh, fundamental to all life and so important. I want to talk about sprawl. 
and land fragmentation uh, and give you some statistics. On the average, 3.2 million acres a year of forest land, wetland, and farmland are developed, converted to more intensive uses. That's 8,700 acres a day. Even in remote areas, I go back up to Sawyer County and uh, we see uh, lakefront sprawl. Hard to find a lake lot. Not only do we see lake lots and subdivisions, there are back lots and then back lots behind the back lots. And uh, we gotta ask ourselves, how far is this gonna go? And then if we take a look at other private lands, from 1978 to 1994, the number of forest woodland ownerships, less than 50 acres doubled. So we took thousands of parcels of land and subdivided them into millions of parcels of land brings real meaning to Will Rogers quote, by land, they ain't making it anymore. And uh, you've gotta ask yourself, uh, should, should this administration or any administration or Congress be relaxing policies on roadless areas when we have these other pressures coming at us from all directions? And yet this is the segment of the land base of the United States that we're losing the most rapidly. And it belongs to all citizens of the United States as well. At any rate, my conclusion is that the, uh, I'll be polite and say the neoconservatives, because you know, I, I don't believe that our, uh, at least our environmental and conservation policies recently are conservative. Uh, the neoconservative definition for roadless areas an area in need of roads. Uh, with a focus on short-term cash flow and, and no view or vision at all for water quality and, and long-term well-being and, and, and what the land is gonna look like. Enough on that. Uh, biodiversity is so important and somehow we've gotta reverse this trend of tremendous loss of biodiversity that's occurring uh, not only in the United States, uh, but all over the globe. For example, uh, the Center for Plant Conservation at the Missouri Botanical Garden tells us that 20% of the native plants in the United States are declining, threatened, or near extinction. A botanist from the University of Wisconsin by the name of Dr. Curtis did a study on 62 plots in northern Wisconsin, a study of the, the vegetation there. Uh, he did this study 50 years ago. Just a couple of years ago, it was repeated uh, by botanists from the University of Wisconsin. And, and what they found is that on the average, 45 of the sites had lost more than 20% of the native species compared to 50 years ago. And I gotta tell you, if you haven't read E.O. Wilson's book, The Future of Life, uh, I recommend it. He's the world expert on biodiversity from Harvard University. It's an easy read. You can read it in a few evenings. And uh, it's also not a pessimistic, uh, the sky is falling uh, read. It's uh, uh, saying, hey, if we get on with it, we can probably do something about this. One of my, my favorite quotes of Aldo Leopold uh, is a lesser known quote that really addresses this issue of biodiversity and I just wanna read this to you. And he said this uh, with sadness and eloquence as he was addressing the planners of the Passenger Pigeon Monument at the confluence of the Mississippi and Wisconsin rivers. And this is what he said, and I quote, there will always be pigeons in books and in museums, but these are effigies and images, dead to all hardships and dead to all delights. Book pigeons cannot dive out of a cloud to make a deer run for cover nor clap their wings in thunderous applause of mass-laden woods. They know no urge of seasons, they feel no kiss of sun, no lash of wind and weather, they live by not living at all. To me, uh, this quote says it all when it comes to our responsibility in preserving all forms of life rather than being selective. We've not only managed to diminish our ecological heritage, but we're also busily rearranging it 
and there's been a lot in the papers lately about exotic species. It's this explosion in slow motion. Invasive weed species now infest about 100 million acres of land in the U.S., and they're spreading at a rate of about 3 million acres a year, which is equal to a strip of land uh, two miles wide stretching from coast to coast. The Union of Concerned Scientists tells us that there are about 7,000 species of exotic plants and animals in the U.S. USDA estimates that we're spending about $138 billion, with a B, billion dollars, dealing with this issue each year. The State of the Great Lakes report issued by the EPA suggests that biological pollution is now more substantial than chemical pollution and perhaps is the most traumatic thing to happen to the Great Lakes since the cut and run timber harvest era when uh, the shores of the Great Lakes were that 50 years ago when Dr. Curtis did the work only one plot had an invasive single invasive species now two-thirds of the plots have invasive species and of the the 2406 wild plants in this state 734 are non-native. Now, I, I want you to just sit back and think about how this whole exotic species issue has changed the way the landscape looks. Our cities and towns, the streets used to be lined with Dutch elm, uh, with elm trees. Dutch elm disease took care of that. Chestnut blight was the dominant tree in the southeastern hardwoods of the United States, and it was written that a couple of centuries ago, a gray squirrel could go from Georgia to Maine on the crowns of chestnuts. Now they're gone. And, and we've got white pine blister rust, kudzu, malaleuca in the Everglades. The list goes on and on. It's endless. Asian longhorn beetle introduced into the ports of New York and Chicago. Uh, we don't know exactly what extent the damage will be of the Asian longhorn beetle, but what we do know is that sugar maple is one of its favorite trees. Will we see a day where sh the sugar maple will go the way of the chestnut or of the elm tree? We certainly hope not. Um, a key reason uh, for man that managing exotics is difficult or dealing with them is difficult is because they thrive in disturbed habitats. And our best defense against exotic plants is to protect our remaining undisturbed native habitats, to maintain the natural biodiversity. And yes, we need strong import regulations. We also need to make investments up front, prospectively, to determine what species, what are the species, the sets of species that are likely to invade and to become major problems. Instead, we spend the money after the horse is out of the barn. I want to mention old growth forests just very briefly and only because this is the issue that uh, perplexed uh, my tenure as chief of the Forest Service and, and almost every chief that preceded me. And in fact, it's this issue that symbolizes the 30 or 40 years of conflict that we have had in, in forest management, especially national forest management in the United States. And by the way, my neoconservative definition of old growth is senile trees that belong in a home, preferably as a two by four or a two by six. Um, but here we are in this state where re we revere the white pine tree, the great tree that uh, attracted the King of England to the New World as he put the king, sent his subjects to the New World to put the king's stamp on these majestic trees so they could be used to maintain the naval supremacy of the British Navy by using them for mass because of their qualities. The fact that uh, England had used up their wood centuries, centuries before they came to the New World and they were just tired of fighting the Scandinavians and they had to maintain this naval supremacy. And we were part of that, and the white pine is, is basically part of the culture of, of this country itself in the colonial days. And yet, 
the only white pine, old growth white pine that we have left is the few acres that we have in the Menominee tribal lands. And my hat's off to the Menominee for having done an outstanding job in managing old growth forest by, by harvesting timber in a truly sustainable way where they haven't built the infrastructure that exceeds over the long term, long term the capability to produce so they get, cut in, get caught up in this knot of we just got to have more and more and yet uh, the land can't sustain it. Uh, I used to think that, gosh, why couldn't we do this with the national forest? Why do we have all these hassles uh, that we have when, when we know how to do this stuff? I've also got to ask another question. Are we going to restore some of the old growth white pine in this state? And if so, where? When are we going to start? What are we willing to give up to have some of it? Certainly, if we start it today, you and I will never see it. Our great-grandchildren might see it. But as a, as a wealthy society, do we really care enough about this? And I've also got to ask another question when it comes to pu public policy, and that's uh, what in the world are we doing harvesting what little remaining old growth we have on public land? I would hope uh, this administration would halt all commercial harvest of old growth on public land. Now, I tell you, that would be a truly conservative legacy. Think of this word conservative, saving something for the future rather than liquidating these assets as quickly as we can. Uh, I don't think Teddy Roosevelt would agree with that definition of conservative. Um, Private land conservation. And I mentioned private land because much of the debate over land management does occur on public land, and this is really the wrestling mat for public policy. But most of the land in the United States, and we have 2.3 billion acres of it, is, on, is in public ownership, private ownership. We've got, for example, uh, 9 million woodland owners who own tracts of land less than 100 acres, and only 5% have professionally developed management plan. I commend Cal for having a professionally developed management plan on his uh, 120 acres up in Marathon County and I would urge all woodland owners to whatever your objective to seek professional advice. In most cases it's free and yet only 5% of the landowners have professionally developed science-based plans uh, for what is, is they do. It's so important. Urban forestry. I want to spend a few minutes, because uh, much, of, much of the urban lands are private. And in fact, we have 100 million acres in the United States that are now cities and towns over what were once forests. Remember the California energy crisis of a couple of years ago? Well, a, a colleague of mine, Dr. Greg McPherson, who's a Forest Service researcher at the University of California, Davis, I went to work and did some analysis of the urban forests in California about that time. And what he found is there are 177 million trees in the state of California providing shade and energy saving function. And those 177 million trees saved the res citizens of California about a billion dollars a year in their air conditioning bill, and they saved the utility industry about a half a billion dollars a year in wholesale energy costs. And he went on with some modeling work to determine that if Californians planted another 50 million trees, uh, that would be the equivalent of seven 100 megawatt generators in energy saving. Now in Milwaukee, you've got about 16% canopy cover, and that saves the city about $15 million a year in stormwater runoff costs. And if you would increase the canopy cover in the city of Milwaukee to 40%, that would reduce runoff by an additional 20%, and perhaps you wouldn't have to dump raw sewage in Lake Michigan quite as often. Now, <laughs> these same trees sequester about uh, 1,677 tons of carbon annually. They save the city almost a million dollars a summer in energy costs, and those numbers would triple 
if you would increase the canopy cover to about 40 percent, which is about ideal in most urban areas. And now if you translate this to cities like Atlanta, to cities like Dallas, uh, to cities like Jackson, Mississippi, the savings are tremendous. Uh, the Forest Service tells us that the urban areas in the United States have room for about another 700 million trees without breaking up any concrete to plant them. So if we calculate in a conservative manner the energy saved from these 700 million trees, that's equivalent to about 30% of the estimated annual production of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge over 50 years. Now I gotta tell you, any national energy strategy that doesn't have tree planting front and center is badly flawed. This is a no-brainer. We know how to do it. It makes our cities look nice. Why is it missing from national policy? Beats me. Um, I, I talk about ecological literacy because truly uh, many of the simple things that we can do to save energy to help are really fairly simple. They're not complicated and they don't necessarily have to be very expensive or costly to the bottom line of many of the industries um, that we, uh, that they could affect or impact. But our real challenge is this challenge of ecological literacy, the term coined by our own Alda Leopold, and that's basically helping people understand what land is, what land does, why land is important to us, and how to interact with the land in an ethical, moral way to promote our quality of life generation after generation after generation, rather than emptying this piggy bank over a couple of generations and, and let another generation worry about, uh, worry about the problem. We've got to make investments in land. We've got to connect people's hearts and minds to what land does. And it's probably getting more difficult. 80% uh, of the people in the United States live in cities and towns and urban areas. There are more demands on our time. The internet, the web, it used to be Nintendo. How many kids go and play in the creek, hike out in the woods, or even have the opportunity if they wanted to? Th those are some of the challenges, the major challenges that I believe we face. Um, Tom Utek's work, and if you haven't seen the ex uh, exhibition, I recommend it. it. It was really inspired by wild places, uh, the places that, that he loved, the places that many of you love, and that's the reason you're living in, in this state of Wisconsin. And to me, these wild places um, are as much of our, the character of our nation as Plymouth Rock, as the Constitution, as Gettysburg. The American frontier was what shaped the character of the American people. Lewis and Clark, Sacagawea, Chief Joseph, Daniel Boone. Why is it then that protecting wild places has become a political football? Used as a tool, in fact, an, a cynical tool to divide Americans rather than unite Americans in a common cause. Why is it the last few decades that those who want to keep the air we breathe clean and the water we drink pure are labeled as liberals? Those who want to save the nation's ancient forests that produce the highest quality water, the most water, preserve their aesthetic qualities. There's only a small fraction of what, what of what we once had left. Uh, these are anti-development wackos. What's going on in society? What is it that we're, we're missing, that we're not getting? Um, well, I gotta tell you, over the last decade or so, particularly what I got involved in, some of the tenacious national contro uh, controversial conservation issues, I spent more time uh, reading about the history of conservation, and I've got to tell you, it's very instructive. I mentioned uh, Frederick Edwin Church's Twilight in the Wilderness, how on that inspired in the 1860s Americans and politicians to view land and nature in a way that they hadn't viewed it before, such that Abraham Lincoln would decide to set aside part of Yosemite National Park 
because this was so important. We all know the legacy of Theodore Roosevelt. As governor of New York, he had this troublesome tendency for protecting natural resources and reigning in corporate power. In fact, the political forces in New York were flummoxed by this guy, this hyperactive intellectual. They had to get this bull out of their china shop, and they found a solution. They would draft him for the vice presidency. Nobody ever does anything as vice president. And six months later, as Senator Mark Hanna said, that damn cowboy's in the White House. <laughs> and the fact is, uh, Roosevelt is more responsible than anyone for defining what conservation means, what it is, in a conservative sense, by being frugal. by saving things for future generations, by maintaining the status quo. What a novel idea. And it wasn't since Jefferson that someone so well versed in the sciences was in the White House. In fact, it's fun to read uh, some of uh, Roosevelt's biographies. If you haven't read Edmund Morris's two books, and the third one is coming out on Theodore Roosevelt, I recommend it. For example, you know, as president, he would set aside time, 12.30 to, to 1 during lunch, to do ornithological readings. Imagine the buzz in the press if a modern day president were to have on his calendar that he was actually doing ornithological readings. Well, his legacy is tremendous. National wildlife refuges, national forests laid the foundation for the national park system. So many firsts. And president, other presidents followed suit. Coolidge, Hoover, set aside land, Franklin Roosevelt, and the tremendous CCC era that in this state reforested 2.3 million acres of cutover in the northern part of the state. Conservation used to be nonpartisan. In fact, uh, the Wilderness Act passed in 1964, signed by Lyndon Johnson, passed the Senate 92 to 1 and the House of Representatives, 312 to 16. Today, it wouldn't get out of committee. And if it made it to the White House, it would be vetoed. Richard Nixon, no liberal by any means, perhaps has a legacy closer to Theodore Roosevelt than almost any other president for the environmental conservation actions that occurred in his administration the Environmental Protection Agency, amendments to the Clean Air Act, extension of the Endangered Species Act, the Marine Mammals Protection Act, the Co Coastal Zone Management Act, the expansion of the national park system. Not many people think about Richard Nixon as a conservationist. Theodore Roosevelt perhaps said it best when he said this, and I quote, a nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. And if he were alive today, I think he'd amend it to say something like this. A nation that destroys its soils, dirties its air and water, destroys its biodiversity, destroys itself. And as I mentioned earlier, this isn't rocket science, science. And I've got an assignment for you. There's a publication called The Conquest of Civilizations Over 7,000 Years. The author is W.C. Loudermilk. It was published in 1953, and it's USDA uh, circular number 90, I believe. And what it is, uh, Loudermilk was assistant director of the Soil Conservation Service in the 1930s, and the Roosevelt administration sent him on a trip around the world to determine why so many of the cultures had declined and disappeared. What was some of the rationale behind this? And this is a fantastic read, by the way. So he spent seven years, I believe, traveling. Uh, cut short by World War II, and he came to a couple of conclusions soil and water, and the misuse of soil and water as we, as I mentioned, in Iraq and in many, many parts of the world. So if we want a future that's secure over the long haul, uh, we need to think seriously about what it will take and what we as a society are willing to forego. And we need to ask ourselves as we spend the billions of dollars, uh, the hours, 
the lives of our beloved soldiers, dealing with the likes of Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden, uh, aren't we ignoring something? It's our air, our food source, our world water supply. What about basic sustainability of the land over the long haul? And I'm not suggesting we should ignore these threats from terrorists and dictators. But on the other hand, we shouldn't ignore the threats uh, to the land. Because generations from now, if our great, 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 great grandchildren and down the line deal with land that's sick, what are they going to say? Especially when they know that we have the technology, the science, and the understanding uh, to deal with many of these issues, perhaps not all. Uh, do we want future generations to ask, why didn't they do a better job? Why weren't they better stewards of God's creation? Thank you, and better get that phone. Have a wonderful evening. Fran tells me we can do a couple of questions, and those of you that need to leave, enjoy the evening, and thank you for coming. Back there. Uh, the question is, um, what is the what do I think is the best way to connect kids, inner city youth, to the environment? Uh, and I got to tell you, I wish I had the answer. Uh, the thing that I do believe is that we have more means to connect with people than we've ever had. Uh, with the internet, with all the technologies that we have, uh, with cable, with TV, and, and somehow we have to be a lot more creative than we have been because so many people just simply don't, don't have the access to the out of doors as those of us that grew up in the woods on a farm had to, to develop this kind of appreciation. So I, I wish I had that answer uh, because I do believe that it, it's, it's easy to say, but it, it's education is the key and connecting people. Uh, to the outer doors in some way is the key. And that doesn't mean you have to live in the woods or you have to uh, live out on the prairie. Uh, you just have to have a basic understanding of how this stuff ticks because this is not all that difficult. Do you know that, uh, that as chief of the Forest Service and the head of BLM, I have yet to have a land developer come to me and say, we want you to do a better job of watershed management. And yet, how many cities do we have in the United States, especially the Southwest, that are water limited? I mean, Scottsdale, Reno, Phoenix, San Diego, uh, the list goes on and on, Las Vegas, and on with the water limitations that we have, and yet we're not spending very much time taking a look at how the system really works. For example, state of Colorado come, came up with one of the most idiotic ideas uh, perhaps of the century and that's to deliver more water to the front range. They proposed clear cutting 40 percent of the water of the Rocky Mountain front to increase water yield and absolutely it will increase water yield just like a parking lot introduces increases water yield. The objective is to keep water on the land longer so it soaks into the ground so it recharges the aquifer so the streams run annually rather than only during perhaps the wet parts of the year. It's this very basic understanding that we seem to be missing as a society. And I sort of tease the scientists uh, that I've worked with over the years a little bit that we're so busy worried about our correlation coefficients and our discriminative function analysis that we fail to communicate some of these very basic things uh, to the American public, at least in a way that they care and it hits home. So uh, I just encourage you to do everything you can to, to uh, help 
young people understand how all this works because my view is also that by the time they're in fourth to sixth grade, the values are set. And that's where the investments need to be made. Thank you. Well, it's really difficult to know exactly uh, uh, what an administration will do. Sometimes they will surprise you. Um, and uh, initially, uh, when this George Bush was elected, I assumed that his conservation policies would be the same as his father's, which were actually quite good. We, we, we didn't, maybe we didn't gain a lot of ground, but, but we certainly didn't lose, lose a lot of ground. And um, uh, my best advice to this president is that he should hire his father and listen to him <laughs> on these issues. Well, manage is, is the arrogant way of our culture or our society uh, to, to say that we're, we're, in fact, nature is reacting to what's going on around us, uh, whether it's our development, whether it's fire, whether it's the climate, and, and, and it's all wound together. The, the important thing, I think, is to have the respect and the ethic that there's a place for everything. And somehow in our society, we view ecosystems as limitless. We, we just can't accept the fact that we have reached a limit in how much water we can pull out of that sandstone aquifer under Waukesha County. And you wonder, where are all these new houses? What, what's going to happen in 50 years? Probably have to be some good government subsidies or go into the water hauling business, Cal. Uh, so, and it's the same with, with wildlife habitats. I think the, we, we, we're, good at, we're fairly good at single species management. You know, we know what kind of habitat rough grouse like. Uh, we know about white-tailed deer, we know about turkeys, and at least some of the more prominent species. But then when it comes to winding this all together, it, it, we get into this whole issue of biodiversity, it gets a lot stickier and we really don't have a good handle of what we're doing. So the key is to, to, to encourage diversity, have as much diversity out there as you possibly can, and let nature take its course in some way. The best example uh, that we have is this whole issue of fire in the West. Fire is not a, necessarily a big problem in, in this state, but I got to tell you, as an agency head in an agency, a couple agencies that dealt with fire on a big time basis, there's not a more frustrating situation because it's very predictable. You turn on your TV, the fires will start in Florida, they grow across the southeastern United States, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, about the same time they start in the Chaparral in California, they move into Arizona, New Mexico, and as the summer progresses, they move up the spine of the Rockies. And when do they go out? When it rains. When we put a fire out, and we're very good at it, uh, our firefighters are the best in the world. They put out 98% of the fires in initial attack. But when we put a fire out, what are we doing? We're saving it to burn another year and it's going to be worse because there will be more fuel. And another interesting thing, I was just with the, uh, the head of fire and aviation from the Forest Service a couple of weeks ago at the Outdoor Writers Conference in Spokane. And I've asked myself this question and I asked him this question and we have the same answer. It made me feel good. Um, 
remember the remember the fires in Southern California last October, 10,000 homes burned. I asked uh, Jerry Williams, what would have happened if there were no firefighters? And the answer is, what would have been different? Was the question. The answer was probably not very much. We can manage the perimeter of the fire. We can save a home here or there. And, and basically, what's going on is a charade with, with us not being willing to accept that sometimes nature rules. And this is the same in spite of all the hoopla about the forest health policies and all of this going on, and or maybe you know the enviros are a result of the fires because we haven't harvested enough. All of the dialogue that you hear around that, it, it's simply nature doing its thing. And we happen to be in a extreme weather cycle compared to where we were uh, a few decades ago. So the point being, uh, this is all, this all fits together and we just need a lot more humility. Back there. When I said, Let me try to summarize that uh, question. Um, uh, a landowner perhaps doesn't have the means and, and therefore has to either subdivide or sell sand and gravel, basically allow his or her land to be mined, and then what federal programs or what other alternatives are there to avoid uh, that sort of degradation to the land. Um, I guess I, I really don't know the answer to that. Uh, uh, contact the lands division of the, you know, the Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin Extension, the uh, uh, Department of Natural Resources, uh, it, some of the, the, the federal land management agencies. I'm not aware of subsidies that would be available in, in that necessarily in that kind of a situation. So, uh, but uh, uh, in, you know, that may be exa an example where we need some community sharing. This, this property rights kick that we're on, again, which is not a very humble approach to the way we treat land and so on in our current society, is a tough one. And hence, European countries can do a lot better job in forest management because they don't get involved in this property rights issue because they, in a sense, if you look at forest management in Germany and, and other places, they also see the communal value of a landowner preserving some forest land to the rest of the community and provide for that in some way. And, but in, in our culture, believe me, we wouldn't hear of, of that. Uh, we're, we're just not ready for it as a society yet. Another one back there.
I hope those of you in front could, could you hear uh, uh, your point? There is a, a couple of other examples, and you're ex exactly right. We, we tend to get stuck in a rut, and we tend, things work for a little while, and we tend to lose our creativity. Uh, the Nature Conservancy and a couple of other organizations have started programs like forest banking for private landowners that uh, conceptually is a great idea that needs to be tested. And uh, I used to sit back in the Forest Service and say to myself, you know, why aren't we doing this? Because what this does is, is if you have small woodland owners or larger woodland owners, that for, they need some money. They've got to pay their taxes. Uh, uh, the only way they, so they have to cash out on their forest and harvest it. And, and perhaps it's not ready to be harvested yet. Perhaps all the values aren't there or there, there are other ways to harvest it other than just simply maximizing the dollar and the fiber. So th this, in a sense, is a communal effort where there will be money in the bank to provide money to this landowner without liquidating their forest based upon harvest on neighboring lands. It's a little bit like carbon trading and other kinds of things, but it's a, those are the kinds of things we need to be trying as we uh, focus on this. And, and leadership needs to be talking about this stuff. Because if leadership, and I really, it doesn't matter where that leadership comes from, whether it comes from the Pope, the President, the Senator, or the Governor, once we start talking about this stuff, the creative juices of society will flow. It's got to be encouraged and talked about. And that's why I hope that, that our presidential candidates, in fact, all of our candidates, talk about all the issues rather than just a replay on security and, and the economy and the tax cuts and so on. Let's hear the new issues, the new ideas. Let's stimulate the creativity of the American people. Mm -hmm. uh, no. It, it, the question was, is there any help, hope for the roadless initiative or is that done? Uh, no, uh, the, I think the action taken by the Bush administration was uh, uh, very predictable. Uh, they understand the popularity of the issue with the, the uh, and it's an issue I know a lot about as I was in the middle of it where we had, we had more public comment on that issue than any other issue the Forest Service had ever dealt with, 1.6 million comments, about 90% in favor. A large portion of those wanting stronger protection. So if you had followed that issue through the three-year course of the issue, it, it got more protective because of the public comment period. Now, the real issue with roadless is I Idaho and Montana and their congressional delegations will not deal with the wilderness issue. And hence, the agency is caught in this vice because the political machinery in those states cannot come to agreement. And hence, Congress is impotent to deal with it, and it's, it's placed right in the, right in the agency's lap. Um, I'm not overly worried about uh, the roadless issue for a couple of reasons. Uh, and and I, I, I kind of think that uh, a year from now, uh, the Bush administration will wish they had done it differently. Uh, because number one, uh, they didn't protect roadless, which is very popular. Number two, they won't be providing many jobs to these communities because the values aren't there. And I'll tell you about those in just a minute. And uh, number three, they'll be criticized for providing or giving the opportunity, sort of an unfunded federal mandate. I tell you, we got an $8.4 billion taxpayer liability in road maintenance on the national forest. Is any governor gonna wanna step up and say, here's a few bucks to fix up these roads? This is a, a national liability that we, we're dealing with. And it's because people refuse to face the issues that was very controversial. And I gotta tell you, from a business sense, it's a no-brainer because uh, the unit cost of operation in roadless areas is about twice of what it is in other areas. Number two, the failure rate of projects is significantly higher in roadless areas than in other areas. So if you're the CEO of a company, what are you gonna do? 
Are you going to invest money where the profitability is the lowest or even the chance of success is the lowest? Probably not. The bottom line is this is a symbolic fight more than anything else. It's really a fight over old growth. Uh, the, how much land in the United States do we want to save as wild and, and non-roaded versus uh, how much do we want to develop? And where is the decision made? Uh, that's, uh, that's what the real hassle is about. I was a little bit surprised when the issue, when roadless became an issue in this state. Uh, and uh, Nadine Bailey, who was at that time head of the Wisconsin-Michigan Timber Producers Association, uh, uh, came, who came from Oregon, and uh, uh, they really turned this into a issue, uh, really never told the uh, citizens of this state that the Shawamigan and Nicolay produce more timber than any national forest in the country, and that the harvest levels have been going up. But that's the communication shell game that goes on when you get into some of these kinds of issues uh, that is difficult. So it's a, um, uh, the, the, the another important point on roadless is uh, uh, the easy stuff is gone. It, and it's been gone for a long time. So much of what's out there is of low value or no value or difficult to access. And uh, another point is um, this is not gonna help local communities because especially in the West, uh, it takes large corporate muscle and money to build roads into these difficult to get to areas. It's, it's not your local logger that's uh, raising a family that's gonna benefit from this. This is the corporate. Yes. But it, it still takes large corporate muscle to, to move into these big timber sales in these roadless areas. This is not a, a family logger operation. This is big industry stuff. Well, I, I would, if you haven't read uh, E.O. Wilson's Future of Life, you know, I'd recommend it. Uh, he doesn't necessarily paint a, uh, a hopeless picture. Uh, and I'm probably most pessimistic on the whole exotic species issue because we can dump all the money in the world into this and, and nature, again, back to the habitat question, nature will sort of take its course that we really don't understand with all the technology. But uh, Teddy Roosevelt came out of the blue. Uh, and using the bully pulpit, mobilized the nation to do a lot of good things. Uh, if we take a look at the security issue, none of us were thinking about security 
five years ago, like we are today, leadership has been talking about this issue, and there's been a lot of activity around it. We also need, le my point is we also need leadership that talks about other things like this. And, and we've got lots of technology. Uh, we certainly, you know, approach with humility. I'm, I'm not a doomsdayer. I'm a little bit worried, not necessarily for the next generation or two, but by the end of the century, uh, if we don't act, that we'd have problems. I think it was Winston Churchill said that in a democracy, you get the government you deserve. Good. Great. Have a wonderful evening.